Da Vinci Code brought this back. These are energy forms which are still alive. People can bring them down and do a variety of things. Probably Jesus himself was that. A gori form of yoga is very much oriented towards this. We have been planning to consecrate an occult form. If one knows how to do the necessary appeal, she will respond to them in a big way. You can get anything you wanted done. Namaskaram Sadhguru, is it okay to visit and spend time in occult temples in the Himalayas? And why are most occult temples related to goddesses? Akam temples are not uh, really made for your normal kind of worship. Anyway, you need to understand the difference and distinction between worship and prayer. Maybe you just know prayer, asking for God, do this, do that. In the culture of Shiva, it's considered obscene to ask the creator to do something as if he doesn't know what he should do. It's, it's considered totally obscene to make any request to God because if he doesn't know, what's the point asking him? So worship is a certain elaborate system and a process to create certain inner situation within yourself. Worship in India involves elaborate procedures which involve tremendous amount of mental application. It is a certain sadhana. It is a kind of kriya for a devotee. When we say kriya, karma means action that you can perform with your body or your mind or your emotion is called karma. Action that is performed internally is called a kriya. So a worshipful, a worshipful attitude or a worshipful action is a kriya, an inner action performed with a devout attitude. See, right now you're doing the morning kriya. We are not asking for devotion because it's purely technically also it'll work because you're twenty-first century. <laughs> when you come on the first day to the yoga program, very secular and logical and correct and everything educated. If I tell you, see, you must do this with devotion, you will leave, many of you. So, we created Kriyas which does not need any particular attitude, just needs focus, that's all. Right now the Kriyas that you're doing are of that kind, which does not really require any kind of devotion. Just do it right, it'll work. It's very technical. So worship or what we refer to as puja is a kriya with devotion involved in it. It's a complex mixture of a certain technicality and emotion. Emotion and technology is a dangerous mix unless it is handled very properly, isn't it? If you handle any technology with emotion, it's dangerous, isn't it so? Yes? Any technology, if you handle it emotionally, it can become dangerous. It is because of this, people who are handling technology, trying to free themselves of emotion, they became like dry sticks. They, they're afraid, they know this much that if emotion comes into handling technology, it can be a disaster. So, they do not know how to keep their emotions away at a certain time, so they destroy the emotion in them. They will become so barren and almost inhuman in so many ways. 
But puja is this dangerous combination, worship is this dangerous combination of technology and emotion. So when we talk about occult temples, prayer is meaningless because it's a technology. But without the right attitude, because it's a subjective technology, but not in the same context as we are referring to spirituality. Occult is not spirituality. Occult is just technology. Like today, you can pick up your cell phone right now here from Pipple Koti, you can talk to somebody in the United States. This is technology. Occult is just like this. You can talk to somebody in the United States without the cell phone. Little more technology. It will happen after some time as technology evolves. Now, uh, from that Graham Bell's instrument, from that one, it's come to this. A day will come when all this is not necessary. Already, you know, I… Uh, I have a Bluetooth mechanism where I don't have to dial, if I just say the person's name, it dials for me. If I say ashram, it'll go to the ashram number. A day will come when even this is not needed sticking out here, a small implant here. If I… whoever I want to talk to anywhere in the world, it will happen. We know it will happen. So occult is without the blue chip you still manage to talk. So it's just technology, you know, different level, that's all. So similarly, somebody sitting somewhere, if they press one button, they can blast you out of people coating with a missile. <laughs> yes? As you can talk to somebody in the United States, somebody in the United States can blast people coating out of the planet. Similarly, with occult, you could do certain things. It is just purely technology, physical. That's why I hesitated to use the word subjective. But it's still subjective because you're not using any external objects. You're just using your body, mind and energy to do these things. Ultimately, no matter what technology, you're only using your body, mind and energy, isn't it? But you're using the other material to serve you. But it is only by using your mind, body and energy that you made the cell phone or the missile or whatever, isn't it? Yes? So the ultimate or the fundamental material that you use to manufacture a cell phone or any piece of technology is just your body, mind, your energy, isn't it? But you are picking up some external material and using it. Initially, if you wanted to manufacture a phone or an instrument you made, you had to take this much material. Now you are taking only this much material. And we are trying to reduce that, reduce that, reduce that further, further. So a day will come when we don't need any material, that will be occult. Modern science and occult are bound to meet somewhere. Bound to meet somewhere if some small changes happen in certain understanding of what's what. So occult is purely technology. And occult is becoming more and more irrelevant by the day because modern technology is advancing at a great pace. Now, to get to talk to somebody in the United States without the cell phone, it may take lots of preparation and effort. And even if you manage to contact them, they may say wrong number <laughs> because they don't recognize you. <laughs> Most of the time I am rejected as Ramna, wrong number, I know this by experience. <laughs> so, <laughs> occult is becoming more and more irrelevant as modern technology becomes subtler and subtler. Occult, the need for occult will come down. This would be extremely important. If you were doing the Chardam Yatra by foot, and there was no cell phone, no nothing, and you're gone for two years from your family to make this trip, then occult would have been extremely important, isn't it? That you can just tell your family, I'm okay. 
I mean people quoting. Yes, it would have been tremendously important, isn't it? But today, because we have cell phone in our pocket, it is not so important to learn all those things, how to contact your family like this. Today we have an instrument where everybody can use, a child can use. So occult becomes more and more irrelevant as technology progresses further and further. So don't waste your time in occult temples. But there are certain other dimensions to occult, which could be used as a stepping stone to a spiritual process. Because in many ways, occult is the final step of physicality. The subtlest point of physicality is what we are using. See, the physical can be used in many ways. For example, if you take information technology, what started as a stone tablet has now come to your tiny blue chip. What would take a whole mountain to be carved upon, today is into a tiny chip. So, the physical has become subtler and subtler. So, the subtlest dimension of physical, when you use it, we call it occult. Occult is using the subtlest phenomena of the physical, but still physical. So, because it's a last, to last step in the physicality, it can also be used as a stepping stone to go beyond the physical. So, there is a variety of mantras, practices, different types of worship and different ways to bring forth forces and forms which are uh, very powerful forms. Many of these goddesses, do you know something about Purusha Prakriti? Purusha Prakriti means… Purusha means if you want to put it in one way, it's masculine, prakruti means feminine. So, in trying to explain the creation the way it is, that which is the seed of creation is called purusha, it's male, but it doesn't have an active role in life. It is just like human birth, the masculine just plants the seed. But the rest of the creation is all feminine, isn't it? So the mother goddess or Parvati or Kali is held as Prakriti. She is the whole creation. But the seed for this creation is Shiva or Purusha. This can be explained as Shiva Shakti or Purusha Prakriti, Yin and Yang and so many things. We are not talking about just two aspects of creation. We are talking about creation and the source of creation. So creation, the whole creation is referred to as feminine and the source of creation is referred to as masculine. Shiva is inert. Very rarely he comes into activity. The rest of the time he is just inert. He is in meditation, he never moves. When he becomes alive, he moves in exuberant ways, but otherwise he is inert. But Prakriti or Parvati or the mother goddess is always active. The trees are growing, the dogs are barking, flowers are blooming, human beings are being born. This is all Prakriti, this is all the work of the mother. Shiva is inert, once in a way he becomes active, otherwise he is always inert. That's how it is described because that's the way the creation is happening, you must understand the fundamental forces in the existence are just personified. These are not to be seen as people. So this whole process of occult is concerned with Prakriti, nothing to do with Shiva. Shiva is not concerned with occult. Though he is a master of occult, occult people who practice occult never worship Shiva. They worship Shiva from a distance, but their daily worship is only for the Devi or the Mother Goddess, different forms. So these forms can be created. This is a land, this has been there everywhere in the world, but here 
they actively created variety of forms, feminine forms, which are very powerful. For example, now if you say Kali, Kali is not just an idol. Many yogis and mystics work to create a certain energy form which functions in a certain way and responds to a certain name. And usually they created very fierce forms because one thing is, these are fierce people, they cannot live with a tame woman. They want somebody really wild, so they created really wild woman. And these are energy forms which are still alive. So they respond to a particular mantra. When they created this, that form and a particular sound was associated. So one who uses that particular sound or mantra in a particular way can bring forth that form. And using this subtle form of energy, many things can be done. This is what the whole science of occult is about. Certain occult temples are created for a certain form and you can call forth that form and do a variety of things. I think these kind of things have been talked about in a different way in other cultures. They always believed someday when you find a lamp and if you rub it, a genie will come. So, <laughs> occult forms were created like this and even today people can bring, bring them down and do a variety of things. The whole system of Tantra is based on this. Agoris, you heard of Agoris? Shiva is Agori. Agori form of yoga is very much oriented towards this. As uh, probably you know, we have been planning to consecrate an occult form in one nook of the Dhyanalinga complex, which is… Uh, which is… she is in the making, she is yet to be born fully. She is in the making, we call her Linga Bhairavi, which is very new form. A Linga typically represents the masculine, but she is a Linga Bhairavi. Bhairavi means it's feminine. She will be of a different nature. We will create her slowly, she's in the making, it'll take some time. She will respond to a particular kind of appeal. If one knows how to do the necessary appeal, she will respond to them in a big way. So you have a kind of super technology with which you can get anything you want it done. That's the whole Devi worship. There's a huge culture of Devi worship in India. Not only in India, everywhere, in Arabia, in Europe, everywhere, goddess worship was the most prominent thing till these monotheistic religions came up. All the crusades and uh, inquisitions were mainly against people who are goddess, goddess worshippers. Do you know? Are you aware of this? In Arabia, they went against all goddess worship and went about burning up all the temples because in Arabia all the temples were wooden temples and they just burnt many temples, hundreds of temples. And in Europe they did the same thing. They just tried to completely, you know, banish uh, the feminine goddess from the planet. But in India she lived and she continues to live everywhere else. Wherever the monotheistic religions dominated, they completely erased the, uh, the feminine worship. One important thing or one crucial point they held against this Devi worship or goddess worship groups was, they said they are doing devil's work because they were doing things that other people could not grasp or understand. They could do things that others would not have the means to do. That means they were into occult. Because they could perform occult, they were branded as devil worshippers and put to death or their places of worship burnt and 
Systematically, over centuries, they completely erased this. I think it's totally absent in Europe except among a few gypsy tribes which have kept it alive even today. Poor nomads who don't stay in one place because they were afraid of persecution. And I think recently that whole uh, very misin… you know, misinformed and misinterpreted book called Da Vinci Code brought this back. It's very badly misunderstood by the writer, but he is touching upon the issue as such. This is about demolishing or banishing the feminine worship. This did not start with whatever this rose and Jesus and everything, it was even before that. Probably Jesus himself was that. But uh, these monotheistic religions which got organized went about completely getting rid of that. But here in this culture, it's still a very strong culture. But even today, even here, it's become like this, people conduct the Devi worship in a little clandestine way, not very openly. Because of social… people have become educated, anything that doesn't appeal to their reason, they want to destroy, you know. Because of this, most of the Devi temples conduct the core of their worship in a very clandestine way, not known to the outside world, just a small group of people. It, everybody is never involved in this because uh, unfortunately society has become so male-dominated. When I say male-dominated, I don't mean man is dominating, that's not true. <laughs> I mean the male mind is dominating. Woman also has become a man today. That's the most unfortunate thing. Women think they are becoming free by becoming like men. That's the… this is the most horrible slavery that a woman has to become like a man, isn't it? The logical mind, the masculine mind is dominating the world. Once the masculine mind dominates the world, anything that doesn't appeal to reason will be destroyed which is happening worldwide. Here also it's happening, but you can't kill it totally because it's too deep-rooted. There are still some hardcore people like me. <laughs> there are many among the, you know, people who have still kept the feminine very alive in them. There are many, many of them. And they will keep it alive, but it can, I think, this feminine worship being mainstream, I think is over in the world. It'll never be mainstream, it'll always be somewhere clandestine.